there's another reason why storytelling is important, and that is because storytelling is an incredibly effective means for organizing information. It works like almost nothing else, and if you think about it, probably the most important information in your life is organized into story in some way. The things that are most meaningful to most of us are things that we tell in narrative, we tell in story. Well, Kate has given you a couple of reasons that we tell stories. Um, I'll add to that by saying one of the great reasons that we tell stories is it gives us a chance to bring everyone together to gather here tonight. And so I'm so glad to welcome you all. We have Gislis community members, we have people from outside of Gislis, librarians, non-librarians, all types of folks. And for centuries and centuries, humans have used storytelling, as Kate also described, to pass along information, culture, religion, and to entertain. I'm fairly confident that this group of humans will find something to relate to this evening. Mm -hmm. um, at this eighth annual storytelling festival, we have quite a variety of stories. We have funny stories, serious stories, some traditional folklore, and, a, and one personal story. And just as we have a lot of stories, we have a lot of different tellers. But I'm personally a fan of how Bill Hall said it. As a general rule, librarians are a kick in the pants socially. We're good humored and progressive and naturally well read. <laughs> but we're also generalists and we know so much about so many things and we're quite the opposite of the boring old poops they have us made out to be. <laughs> Most of us are full of life and some of us are even full of the devil. And then said this, I propose that before, instead of giving you a verdict, you solve a riddle. And whoever can give me the best answer to that riddle will be awarded the heifer. Well, the wealthy farmer didn't want to go against the burgermeister he was new after all. He didn't want to start off on the wrong foot. And the shepherd, well, there was no way he could get the heifer without going along with this, so they both agreed. Here is the riddle. Tell me, what is the swiftest thing in the world? What is the sweetest thing in the world? And what is the richest thing in the world? Wow. But unlike me, Rory O'Donoghue lived in County Cork in Ireland with his wife. And his wife made the most amazing stockings. They were the kind of stockings that could keep your feet warm on even the coldest of winter nights. And Rory would go from town to town selling them. Well, on one of his journeys, a dense fog lay over the whole countryside, and Rory got very lost. He was walking and walking all day, and he had no idea where he was, and the fog didn't dissipate until nighttime. And by this time, Rory was, was very hungry and tired, but he happened to see a little cottage by the side of the road, and there was light coming from inside, so he, he went up to the door and, and he knocked, and an old man answered, who was hunched over and wizened with age. And when he saw Rory, he said, Welcome, Rory O'Donohue. Rory had never seen this man before in his life. But uh, the man was welcoming him into his house, so Rory went in. The year was 1989, and I was six years old. I was standing at Chicago O'Hare Airport at the arrivals gate, and I was waiting. This was going to be one of the most important moments of my life. But in order for you to understand why it was one of the most important moments of my life, we have to go back to 1974 and to Kiev, Ukraine, where my dad is in his mid-20s, a young man, and had just married my mother. My dad's a real character. He is incredibly intelligent, and he's got perfect pitch, great musical ear. I've always been jealous of that. But he loves music. And growing up, he would listen to the Beatles. It was one of his favorite bands. But unfortunately, in Ukraine and all of the USSR, Beatles were not allowed to come and perform, nor were their albums allowed to be sold. So my dad would listen to the bootleg Beatles tapes. And he particularly loved Can't Buy Me Love. And he did as best as he could to sing along with it. He couldn't speak English at the time. And he just sounded it out. And it went something like this. Buy me low, buy me low, buy me low. 
Ho! So, pamilo means broom in Russian. So. <laughs> as far as the sisters were concerned, they were as different as two girls could be. Snow White, the older sister, was quiet and gentle, and she helped her mother with the chores around the house. Rose Red, the younger sister, was wild and adventurous. She helped her mother by running the errands. Snow White found their quiet life fulfilling, while Rose Red found it dull and boring. Snow White's favorite thing to do was sit on the porch and daydream. But Rose Red loved to run through the woods pretending she was having an adventure. The sisters loved each other. They didn't always get along very well. Winter was the worst because their little cottage did not have quite enough room for the two girls and their mother, so they were constantly getting on each other's nerves. They fought frequently from about November till March. Everyone just spent those months in a very bad mood. One night, however, when the girls were almost grown, all of this changed. There once was a sea captain who lived all by himself, but he was brave and adventurous, and he feared nothing on the land or sea. He also loved to read, and every night he would sit by his fireplace with a book, reading into the wee hours of the morning. One such night, as the captain read, a great storm raged outside. Rain splattered the windows, and wind moaned and groaned and howled through his old house. But the captain didn't let any of that bother him. He just continued to read. Suddenly, there was a thump at the door. The captain looked up and saw something large and dark moving right through the door. It looked like a tree stump wrapped all in black. And on its tree root-like legs, it scuttled quickly and quietly across the floor coming to sit between the captain and the fireplace. What a strange visitor, the captain said. In all her eight years, she had never yet managed to grow a beard, and she didn't think that she would be able to succeed before tomorrow morning. But still, she wasn't deterred. If she couldn't grow a beard, she would simply have to make one. And so, using a bit of ribbon and some string, she tied her cat to her chin. Surely this would fool the gruff pirate captain. When Jane returned to the docks, she again said, Arr, and told the pirate captain that she wished to join his crew. And then she swore a bit and asked for a drink. And the pirate captain was very impressed. He agreed that any man with such a glorious beard would be welcome to join his crew. All he needed was a name for this new crew member, and Jane, who by this point was a little drunk off her rum, said, Call me Catbeard. Now he didn't pay any attention to the tall and majestic oaks or the middling pines. He was looking for the perfect tree, the smallest tree. He came right up to that smallest tree. He set down his basket, and he took up his axe, and he swung it straight into the tree. And then the sun disappeared. There were no clouds in the sky, and the wind did not bring them in. So he looked up, and there in front of him was the most massive troll. It must have been at least nine feet tall and nine feet wide, and it had ghastly gray skin. Ho, oh, hum, said the troll. You chop down my tree, and I'll cut you off below the knee. Well, he didn't like the sound of that, so he took the axe, and he ran straight home. And he, he said, that's just wrong. I did not like that one bit. That's just wrong. That porridge tasted like, shut the front door. <laughs> no, that's what Goldilocks actually said, because there were three bears coming in the front door. Goldilocks backed into the hall, and she picked up a piece of that smashed chair, a leg that had a really splintery end. And Goldilocks said, back off you three, because I'm not going back to juvie. <laughs> well, finally, the bear, who was now a man, told his story. He had been a prince. And then he had come upon an evil troll, an evil troll who had cursed him because he had refused to marry an evil troll princess the Troll Queen's daughter, and, well, he'd been cursed. He'd been cursed to be a bear by day and a man by night, and the only way to break the curse 
was to find a woman who would live with him for a full year without revealing his true identity. Alcarn could think as she heard this story was what woman would stay with a, a strange bear for a whole year with not a single explanation? <laughs> it was preposterous. And even before they began climbing Shumat Mountain, night overtook them. And they came to where the path was running alongside a river, and the moon was shining bright. And Ray looked over into the river, and he saw the moon shining down in it. And he said, look! And all the brothers stopped and looked. And Ray said, what in the world is that now? And Rex said, it's a yellow cheese. And Rob said, no, it's not. Rob was the biggest brother and the oldest one. He said, it's a lump of gold. And you know what? We're going to get it. And People grew poor. They didn't have enough of the things they needed. And after a while, even food became scarce. So the young king knew he had to do something. And he thought, and he looked around, and he said, why are we wasting our resources on all these useless old people? Why are we giving them food when we hardly have enough to eat ourselves? They've lived their lives. It's time for us to live ours. And so the king issued an order. Everyone over the age of 50 would be rounded up, marched into the forest, and left to fend for themselves. I'm sure that some of these stories were old favorites of yours, and I hope that some of them were brand new to you. We've given you these stories tonight. And the next time you hear them or tell them, I hope you add a little of yourself in, into them. Because storytelling really is a living art, and stories are never fixed, and neither are their endings.